Message of Upanishads. So, Upanishads are a collection of philosophical texts which form the theoretical basis for Vedanta. In the purest sense, they are the oral commentaries passed down generations which explain the essence of the Vedas. Earlier, their study was confined to the Brahmacharis, the Brahmins and the Sannyasis. But over a period of time, the Upanishads have influenced world culture in part through uh, hin later Hindu texts such as the Bhagavad Gita. The Gita Dhyanam, a nine verse poetic invocation that is often published with the Gita, celebrates the purported in Upanishadic influence in a famous verse stating that the Upanishads are the cows and the nectar like Gita is the excellent milk and Krishna is the milkman. Let us now hear straight from Swamiji his thoughts about the rich and motivational message contained in the Upanishads. A very good evening to all of you and welcome to the last of the lecture series, the three part lecture series on the Gita, the Vedanta in general and the Upanishads. This evening I shall talk about the Upanishads and in particular one Upanishad, the Kena Upanishad. The Upanishads, as you have just heard, are part of the Vedas, the core texts of the Hindus and the Upanishads form the philosophical essence of the Vedas. Often these Upanishads are found at the end of the Vedas. That is why the message of the Upanishads is also called Vedanta. Vedanta in two senses. Vedanta means the end of the Veda, literally, in two senses. One sense is literally, physically, these Upanishads come towards the end of the uh, Veda, the mantra sanghitas of the Vedas. That is one reason. The other reason is anta in the sense of culmination, end in the sense of the highest knowledge contained in the Vedas. So, Upanishads contain the highest philosophical thinking and these are ancient texts dating back 2000 years, 2500 years. Most of them are even by modern scholarship standards. Um, they are dated to somewhere around the time of Buddha uh, or even before that, probably before that. So, they are all 25, 30 centuries old, these texts. And you will see how interesting, how profound and how uh, I would say modern or even postmodern in thinking they were at that time. All right. Uh, the Upanishads, there are many of the Upanishads. There are uh, we, we heard about 108 Upanishads, but there are 10 major Upanishads. There are 10 major Upanishads. And why are these major Upanishads? Because the commentator Shankaracharya, some 1200 or 1300 years ago, he wrote commentaries on 10 Upanishads, non controversially on 10 Upanishads. There is an 11th commentary on the Shvetashvata Upanishad, which is little doubtful whether it is by the original Shankaracharya or some by some later commentator. But 10 commentaries are uh, non-controversial, definitely they were written by Shankaracharya and that brought these 10 Upanishads into prominence and they, uh, they form the core texts of Vedanta, Vedanta philosophy. The 10 Upanishads which are generally studied are uh, the Isha Upanishad, Kena Upanishad, Katha Upanishad, Prashna Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Mandukya Upanishad, Taittiriya Upanishad. Aitareya Upanishad, Chandogya, and the Brihadaranyaka. Upanishad. We monks have a handy shloka 
to remember this order. This is the order actually in which they are sometimes studied. So there is a shloka which says, Isha kena katha prashna mundamandukya titirihi aitareyam cha chandogyam brihad aranyakam tatha. So there are these ten Upanishads in order. And uh, the one which we will concentrate upon this evening is the Kena Upanishad, the second one here. And it's called the Kena Upanishad because the first word in the Upanishad is Kena. It starts with Kena, with this word. Sometimes the Upanishads are named like that. So Isha Upanishad, the first word in the Upanishad is Isha. Isha Avasya Midam Sarvam. So the first word. But that does not mean the Kata Upanishad starts with the first word Kata. So there are different uh, meaning, there are different reasons why these names are there. Among them, the biggest Upanishad is the Brihadaranyaka, the la, this tenth one. And one of and the smallest is uh, Isha Upanishad. Kena Upanishad is also very small. Often these Upanishads are in the form of a dialogue between the teacher and the taught. There is a student comes and asks a question. For example, in the Mundaka Upanishad, there is a student called Shaunaka. He comes and asks a question to the teacher. Kasminu bhagavo vigyate sarvamidam vigyatam bhavati iti. Sir, by knowing what is everything known? So, a shortcut, it will be very useful. What is that subject by knowing which I can know everything? So, this is a very interesting uh, question. And the answer is equally interesting. But we will not go into that. The Kena Upanishad also begins with a question. Katha Upanishad, for example, is a well known Upanishad in which it is a dialogue between Nachiketa and Yamaraja. Many of you may have heard of it. A little boy called Nachiketa goes and meets death. Yama is death, the lord of death. So this boy asks a question to death about what survives beyond death. And that is how, that is the dialogue between Yama and Nachiketa. Uh, in the Keno Upanishad, we have a dialogue between a student and a teacher. But in the Kena Upanishad, the names of the student and teacher are not given. It is in the form of questions and answers, but the name is not given. Uh, this Upanishad, Kena Upanishad is in the Sama Veda. You know, there are four Vedas, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda and Atharva Veda. Each of them have Upanishads. These Upanishads are scattered over all these Vedas. And, uh, in the Sama Veda, we find the Chandogya Upanishad, for example, and we find the Kena Upanishad in the Sama Veda. The Upanishads have been translated over the last 100, 150 years. The German philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, he read a translation of the Upanishads and a very interesting way he got the translation. You know, um, Aurangzeb's elder brother, Darashuko, he was very interested in different religions. So, what he did was, uh, Darashuko, you have heard of Darashuko? Yeah. So, what he did was, he got some pandits to translate the Upanishads into Persian. And there was a Persian copy of the Upanishads. Of course, later on he did not come to power, Aurangzeb had him killed and Aurangzeb came to power. But this copy was remaining. And um, a French Indologist, a French Indologist from Paris, um, his name is um, Antoine Duper, uh, Duper, I have forgotten the exact name, Duperon, Duperon. I think this is the spelling, I am not sure, Anquetil Duperon, you can look it up in the net, Anquetil Duperon. He came to India to search for uh, texts of the Zoroastrians. But he uh, got a lot of ancient texts of different religions and he uh, found this copy, the Persian copy of the Upanishads, the Persian copy which was translated under the orders of Darashuka, he found that copy, he took it back to France and he translated it into Latin and he published it as Upne Khat, Upanishad, it became Upne Khat. The book was called Upani Khat. And I often wondered why it became Kha instead of Sha. It is Upani Shat. How did it become Khat? But you know, there are different traditions in chanting the Vedas. And I found 
one pandit from the Kashi tradition of uh, chanting the Vedas. In, um, in Gangotri, I met a pandit, a monk, he was a good scholar. He was chanting the Purusha Shuktam. Purusha Shuktam, Sahasra Shirsha Purusha. He is chanting Sahasra Shirekha Purukha. All the Sha becomes Kha. Then I asked him, how does this happen? So this is an our Vedic Shakha. It is chanted like this. So I thought, maybe he was not wrong. Dupedon was not wrong. Maybe the version he got must have been Upanishad, not Upanishad. Okay, whatever. And this came into the hands of Schopenhauer. He read it and later on he commented, these, there is no study in the world more profitable than the study of the Upanishads. And I consider this to be the solace of my life, the consolation of my life and the solace of my death. And it seems he used to study a bit of this every day before going to sleep, he used to study a bit of the Upanishads. His uh, famous work, The World as Will and Idea, I have not read the whole thing, it is a huge work, but I just out of curiosity I went through the English translation, a part of it. In the first 10 pages, I came across about half a dozen references to Vedanta. And in the introduction, he says, in the world as will and idea, Schopenhauer says that what I am going to set forth in these volumes was best known to the ancient Hindus. It was very well known to the ancient Hindus. This is what I am going to try to tell you in the modern people. So, Schopenhauer. Anyhow, let us come back to the Upanishads and the Kano Upanishad. In the Kano Upanishad, you can see it is a very small volume. It is with Upanishad with the translation and notes. So, it is it's a very small Upanishad, but very powerful as you will see. It starts with a question from the student to the teacher. What is the question? The question is, here is my mind thinking about objects. Here is my eyes, they are seeing things. I am thinking, I am seeing, I am hearing, I am speaking. What is it? What power is it? which impels my mind to think, my eyes to see, my ears to hear, my tongue to speak. See, the question is very mature. This shows a student is quite a profound student. I mean, he is not superficial, not a beginner. Why is it a mature question? Because he says, this body is inert. Sanskrit term is jada. This body is inert. There is a dead body and here is a living body. In this body, I feel consciousness. I feel I think, I speak, I see. What extra thing is there in this body which is not there in a dead body? What is the speciality? You know, you can see this fan is th that fan is moving and this fan is not moving. The fan does not move by itself. If it could, it would have moved. Now, this fan is not moving and that is moving. That leads you to ask the question, what extra thing is there which makes the fan move? So, you are inquiring about electricity. What is it that is making that one move and this not moving? You have a glass of water. You taste it, tasteless. And another glass of water just like that. You taste it, it tastes salty or sweet. And it looks exactly like that. Then you ask, what is that invisible thing which has come into this glass of water which makes it taste salty suddenly? So you are inquiring about something called salt or sugar. There must be something which has come into it which is invisible. We do not know it, but it is changing the properties. Something is happening here now. In this body, which is matter, this body is matter. And I, I feel a first person experience here. The philosophers call it the qualia, the problem, this hard problem of consciousness, they call it the qualia. There is a first person experience. This chalk is white. Medicine or science will say, when I see this white chalk, there will be some firings in the brain and that is the sensation of seeing something white. But as a person, as a conscious entity, there is an experience of whiteness. You know, there is an experience, actual vivid living experience, which is not captured in the firings of the neurons. That is a conscious experience. And that has not yet been explained by science. You just, still, we have not gotten around to explaining it. What gives a first person experience of actually experiencing something within? And a student is asking about that. What is it that shines in my mind, making me aware of objects? What is it that makes my ear hear? Actually, the experience of hearing, the experience of seeing, the experience of speaking. 
what the word he uses is deva. Deva here does not mean devata, it means something shining. What is that shining inside me, which makes me perform all these functions? Now let me give you the original question in Sanskrit. This is the question. Kene shitam patati preshitam mana, kena prana prathama prayeti yukta, kene shitam vachami maam vadanti, chakshu shrotram kaudeva yunakti. Kene shitam patati preshitam mana, controlled by what, impelled by what does my mind think about objects? Kena prana prathama prayeti yukta, what controls the life forces in this body? Kene shitam vachyam imam vadanti, under whose impulse these words are coming from my mouth. Chakshu shrotram kaudeva yunakti, which shining entity is, is impelling eyes, ears. So, he is asking a question about, about the reality within. What is that within me? This is the question. It is a subtle question, a deep question. And then the teacher gives the answer. Let me explain the answer and then I will go to the original uh, answer given by the teacher. Because if I tell you straight away, it would not make sense. Very enigmatic answer. The teacher says, in one word, the answer is consciousness. The, what you are asking about, O oh student, it is consciousness. Chaitanyam. The word is Chaitanyam in Sanskrit or Chit, Chaitanyam, Chit, these are the words used and what he says is, there is a consciousness in you, this is Chaitanyam and you have a mind and you have a body, this consciousness shines in the mind and through that in the body, in all the organs of the body and you feel this consciousness. This is the answer. Now, the answer here is, the thing to be noted here is, the teacher presents consciousness in five aspects, These five points you have to understand, appreciate. First of all, consciousness is not a part of your body or your mind. Consciousness is not a part of your body or your mind, it is apart from your body and mind. Here it is different from science, because modern science would say consciousness is a product of your body, even your mind is a product of your body, mind and consciousness all are products of the brain, that is what physiology would say today. But here the teacher says consciousness is apart from your mind and body, first point, it is not a part of your body, it is not a product of your body. Second point, it is apart but it pervades and illumines the mind and body. Consciousness pervades and illumines the mind and body, enabling it to function. Third point, this consciousness is not limited by the mind and body. It exists apart from the mind and body also. It is not limited to it. It is not something here in this particular brain, you know, in this part of the body. It is not limited by the body. Third, this consciousness is known, it is known in the functioning of the mind and body. The functioning, through the functioning of the mind and body, we can know consciousness, we can experience consciousness. And fifth, the last point to be appreciated is, without the mind and body, consciousness is still there, but it cannot be known, it is not experienced. Example, five points, I will give you an example. There is light here from these tube lights, there is light here, here is my hand and light is being reflected from this hand, okay. it is being reflected from this hand. The light which is being reflected from this hand, you can see here, the light being reflected from this hand, the light is not a part of this hand, it is not a product of this hand, okay. first point. The second point is, it pervades the hand and illumines the hand. Third point is, I can understand the light, a third point is, it exists, it is not limited by the hand, other than the hand also it exists everywhere. And the fourth point is, 
it's by the reflection in the in this hand that I can understand the light. Just now here I cannot understand the light. But when I put my hand here and it shines, I can understand the light. I can experience the light when it is reflected. And the last point, very interesting is, if I remove the hand, the light is still there, but it is not experienced. Now it is experienced. Now it is not experienced. Just like that, consciousness, chaitanyam is not a product of the body, brain or anything. It is not a property of the body or brain, not, not a part of it, not a part, not a prop property, not a product. Second, it illumines the mind and the sense organs. Third, it is not limited by the body and mind, it can exist apart. Fourth, consciousness is understood when I think, when I see, when I hear. The students question, what makes me think, what makes me hear, what makes me speak. In all these actions, consciousness alone is understood, just like light is being reflected from this hand. And fourth is, without this body, without any thoughts in the mind, consciousness will still be there, but you cannot appreciate it. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot feel it, you cannot appreciate it, you cannot uh, experience it, so to say, within quotes. This is the point. And this is what the teacher is going to say, but in his unique language. The question was, what is it? that makes me think, what is it that makes me see, what is it that makes me speak, what is that special deva, shining thing. And the answer given by the teacher is, what I have just told you, but in his unique way. What he says is, Shrotrasya Shrotram Manaso Mano Yat Vachoha Vacham Saupranasya Pranaha Chakshushas Chakshur Atimuchya Dheera Pretya Asmad Loka Damrita Bhavanti a very profound verse. In one verse, he has said everything. He says, O oh student, the question which you have asked, the answer to that is, instead of saying directly consciousness, he says, what you are asking for is Shrotrasya Shrotram. It is the ear of the ear. Ear of the ear? Huh? Manaso Mana. It is the mind of the mind. Vachoha vacham, it is the speech of the speech. Pranasya prana, it is the life of life. Chakshu says chakshu, it is the eye of the eye. What is the meaning of this? I am sure the student must have been mystified. What, what kind of answer is this? What makes my mind think? It is the mind of the mind. What makes me speak? It is the speech of the speech. What makes me hear? It is the ear of the ear. What it means is, it is the consciousness, Chaitanyam, which functions through eyes and speech and mind and, uh, 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 and ears. It is this consciousness which functions. So, in that sense, the eye of the eyes is Chaitanyam, consciousness. The speech of the speech, what makes speech work is consciousness. What makes mind think is consciousness. What makes ears hear is consciousness. It is exactly like electricity. Because electricity is there, the fan is moving. The same electricity in the light makes it shine. The same electricity in the air conditioner makes the air conditioner function. Now, it does not mean electricity is that going round and round. It does not mean electricity is the light coming out of that that uh, incandescent tube. Same electricity come flowing through these various instruments has different effects. The same consciousness flowing through these organs of knowledge, through the mind, organs of action, has different manifestations. But he says all of that is the same thing, consciousness. So, Shrotrasya Shrotram Chakshu Shas Chakshu ah, Vachoha Vacham so, pranasya prana, it is the life of life. So, this is the point the teacher is making. And then he says, what is, so, so what? What happens? He says, generally we think of ourselves as this much, mind, body, organs, actions. He says, if you can understand yourself as consciousness, which is illumining all this, which is enabling all this to happen, if you understand yourself as consciousness, then he says, 
Atimuchya dhira pretya smad lokad amrita bhavanti. You become immortal. Huge claim. What is mortality? He says Chaitanyam plus body and mind. This is what we regard ourselves as is equal to I. We think of ourselves as a bundle of consciousness, mind and body. And what the teacher is saying is that if you can understand that you are consciousness alone, Chaitanyam. This is what the Upanishad is saying. If you realize yourself as that, you become immortal. Why do you become immortal? Because first, this Chaitanyam is not part of the body which is mortal. Body is born, it changes, it will die. That's absolutely true. It's true of the Ajnani, one who is not, uh, has not got realization. It's true of the Jnani also. All the Jnanis, Ramakrishna or Vivekananda or Christ or Buddha or Krishna, all of them had bodies and the bodies are gone. But this consciousness is not part of that. It exists even when the body is not there. When you know yourself as this, you become immortal. You know, know yourself as immortal. It's already there. It's already there within you. So, Atimuchyadhira Pritya Asmad Lokad Amrita Bhavanti. When this body will fall away, when this body dies, you realize this truth and this body will one day die. You do not take up another body, you are free. This is the Hindu idea of moksha, of freedom. So this freedom comes from jnana. What jnana? Realizing yourself as the consciousness which you already are. The consciousness apart from body and mind. Shankaracharya in his very famous Nirvana Shatakam, Mano buddhi hankara chittani naham, nacha shrotra jivve, nacha ghrana netre, nacha vyoma bhoomir na tejo na vayu, Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham. You have heard, most of you have heard this. Very beautiful hymn. What does it mean? It means, I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not my memories, my personality, I am not even the I. This, right now I am seeing I. I am not this also, because this I is here in the mind. I am the consciousness illumining the I. So I am not even the I. I am not the body made, made of five elements. This physical body, I am not that. Then what am I? Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. This consciousness, I am this. This Nirvana Shatakam. Exactly the same philosophy. And this is what the teacher is saying. So they, they don't want anything for themselves. They have got what they want. Swami Ramakrishna and the Shashi Maharaj, one of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, he was telling how he suffered in life to set up the ashram in Chennai. Uh, so a lot of struggles he went through. So one of the disciples, an American lady, Sister Deva Mata, she was upset when she heard the saintly person has suffered so much in life. He said, oh Swami, why did, why did you have to suffer so much? It's unfair. Immediately the Swami became rather, uh, you know, inspired. She stood up and said, what are you saying? My true life is infinite. This little life belongs to the Lord. Let him play with it as he will. My true life is infinite. I am completely undisturbed. I will just quote to you from Yashtavakra Gita, the highest text of Advaita Vedanta. He says, what does the Jnani realize? May Ananta Maham Vodav Vishwapota Sobhavata May Ananta Maham Vodav Vishwaviti Sobhavata Udetu Vastamayati Name Vritti Navaksha I am an infinite ocean of consciousness. I am an infinite ocean of consciousness. And this world, including this body, this, this body is not an infinite ocean of consciousness. So this body, this mind and all others, in this infinite ocean of consciousness, these are all waves. Let them rise, Udetu, Vastamayatu. Let them settle. Let birth come. Let death come. Name Vritti Navakshati. I am not increased. You know, the ocean does not increase when a wave comes up, even a tsunami wave. The ocean remains the same. The same water. And when the wave subsides, the ocean is not reduced there. Similarly, when death comes, I am not reduced there. When um, failure comes, or you, uh, you know, your 
insult is or some kind of unhappiness comes, you are not reduced thereby. When you are exalted, when you are honored, when you are successful, you are not increased thereby. Namay Vriddhi Namah Because all of this, these are all waves in the infinite ocean of consciousness which I am. When I think like this, when I know this, I feel good. But this, this goes, goes, away, goes away. Moment you're out of the lecture hall, back to the mess or in the study, and then you forget this, and then all troubles start again. Right? So, what is the solution to this? The answer is this what you know right now is an intellectual knowledge. Something you, you've heard, you feel inspired, and you feel good. But this is not your core experience or your, your core belief. Your core belief is still that I am this body. And I am this mind. This has to shift. The I is still here. It is here. The body and mind. It has to shift to here. And that's not happened yet. When it shifts there, you don't have to think that I am consciousness, Aham Brahmasmi. I remember, there was a very senior Swami, we were discussing with him in uh, Haridwar, this very question, one of the Swamis asked the question, at least I have to hold on to this knowledge, only practice necessary is to hold on to this knowledge that I am consciousness and that Swami said, no, nahi, ye to, yehi to nahi karna hai. The actor who acts as a beggar in a street play, so the boy who is acting as a beggar in the street play, does he have to keep remembering, I am not a beggar, I am a student of IIT Kanpur, let me not forget that, otherwise I will be in deep trouble. He doesn't have to remember that. He can pour himself into that acting. Because his very being is that I am so and so, student of IIT Kanpur, this is my true identity. This is what I am acting as, as a beggar. In fact, he has to keep that beggar consciousness in mind, rather than his IIT student consciousness in mind. The day your consciousness is firmly established, your idea, and this establishment happens in the mind only, that I am Chaitanya. This mind and body are objects. It happens. This shift happens. Then you need not hold on to this. You can do whatever you are doing with full uh, attention. You can be a student, you can be a housewife, you can be a, a monk, whatever. So, till that point, I am consciousness, I am Chaitanya, this will not help much. It's a good practice only. It's not realization. Ye Brahma Gyan nahi Ye ek dharna Which is very good. How do I go to the Brahma Jnana? The idea is in Vedanta is always there. Shravan Manan Nijityas. So I am Vivekananda says, fill yourself with these thoughts. Think well about them. And the shift happens. <coughs> it happens. I have met people to whom this shift has happened. And when that happens, one sign is it's permanent. I met a person to whom it has happened. First thing he did was, he tried to forget it. He wanted to see if it's just another spiritual experience, a vision or something like that. Or is it something real and permanent? He did not do anything about it. And he says, that was seven, eight years ago, till today, every moment is unforgettable, blazing forth all the time, unchanging. No matter what you do with your mind, what you think, what you do with your body, that knowledge will be permanent. Just as you are Mr. So and So, that you cannot erase by any, any kind of uh, thinking. You may think this way or that way, but you cannot erase who you are. This is even deeper than that. So that shift happens. For God, that thinking, meditating, filling us with these ideas. Because it is the truth, the shift will happen. One more question, we'll finish. Yeah. So do we all share the same consciousness? Yes. Yesterday we talked about that. Is it a separate consciousness in each body and mind? Or one consciousness? And the answer in uh, Sri Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 13, shloka number 2 or 3, which is Kshetragyam Chapi Vamvitti Sarvakshetreshu In all these fields, bodies and minds, it is the one consciousness shining forth. But you will say that, how is it that uh, there he is happy and here he is a person who is tied into the same consciousness. The consciousness is illumining the happiness in that person's mind, consciousness is illumining the sadness in this person's mind. It's flowing through different minds. So it's the same consciousness, just as it's the same person. We are one consciousness and at that level we are all one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here with all of you.
body expression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swamiji, from all of us. I'm sure um, so many profound thoughts just in three days were a little too much for many of us. But still, as, in, as Swamiji said, that um, with practice and with uh, lots of shravan, manan, and all, uh, we uh, I hope we all will get to that truth. So thank you very much, Swamiji, to come over uh, to IIT and illumine us all. Uh, I would like to ask Professor D.P. Mishra to present a small momento from the Vivekananda Samiti to honour us.